loss. There's so much silence around this topic, damaging silence, but you're helping to change that by being here. As everyone's getting settled in, I'll take just a moment to orient you a bit. I'm Victoria. I'm on the PESI team that plans trainings, and I'll be moderating today's session. With so many clinicians on live today, the chat feature in Zoom will be off, but in a little while, we'll turn on the Q&A feature. And when we do, please enter content-related questions for our presenter there. Before you enter a question, though, please see if someone else already asked your question, and if they did, upvote it instead of asking again. That'll help ensure that I know the questions that are really most frequently asked, and then we can get to as many of those questions as possible. Any technical or other questions that you might have for PESI, please take a look at the FAQ tab in your portal. If you have questions about CE credits, there's a CE tab in your portal that probably has the answer. And if you didn't already sign up for a CE upgrade package, you can still do so for live credits if you're planning on staying with us all day. Or if you can't watch the full training today, you can pre-order the self-study version. In your portal are also your handouts and a virtual store chock full of more training resources. Take a look at those anytime. Now, please help me welcome Dr. Julie Bindeman. As a result of her own reproductive story, Dr. Bindeman has pursued intensive training in the field of reproductive psychology, in which she writes, teaches, and practices. Dr. Bindeman has served on the American Society for Reproductive Medicine's Mental Health Professional Group, including on the Executive, Continuing Education, and Social Media Committees, as well as on their anti-racism task force. She has been appointed by the governor of Maryland to serve on that state's maternal mental health task force, and she served on the board and committees of organizations such as the Maryland Psychological Association, the National Abortion Rights Action League in Maryland, Rainbow Families, the Jewish Coalition Against Domestic Abuse, and Uprooted. She has received several awards for her work, including the Carl F. Heiser APA Presidential Award for Advocacy and the National Council of Jewish Women's Women Who Dared Award. She's authored book chapters on maternal mental health and is co-owner of Integrative Therapy of Greater Washington, a private psychotherapy practice located in Rockville, Maryland. Thank you so much for being here today with us, Julie. We're so excited to learn from you. Thanks so much for having me. Good morning, everyone. I hope that everyone is doing well this morning. Um, and I'm really glad that you can spend the day with me. So looking forward to that, looking forward to your questions. Feel free to, to, to show, show the reactions, which is great, because um, it just sort of gives me a, a chance to know that there are people out there and I'm not just talking to myself. Um, so I think it's always important to start talking about scope of practice. So when we're learning something new, um, it's so easy to just want to dive into it. And what I encourage you is that um, this training is a fabulous start. It doesn't mean that once you complete this training, you know all that there is to know about pregnancy loss. I mean, I've been doing this work for a really long time and I'm still learning new things. So I would encourage you that if this is an area that you are looking to develop or to make more robust in your practice, that it's always useful to seek out consultation. Um, again, something that I continue to do, even though I've been doing this work for a really long time. And I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, the one, one thing that Victoria already mentioned is that I am currently an executive committee member for the Mental Health Professional Group of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. Um, so if I mention ASRM, please know what my affiliation is, but I receive nothing for them. It's a volunteer position I do. So before we dig into this, I want to make some acknowledgments that um, what we're going to talk about, just as Victoria said, is not something we tend to talk a whole lot about. I think as a society, as a culture, as a country, we're doing better with it, um, but still it's not as normalized as I think it 
needs to be. I think that pregnancy loss is something that occurs far too often for it to be so in the shadows. And I think contextually what's important to recognize is that we're not a culture that deals with death very well. So that's, I think, across the board. And so it's no surprise that pregnancy loss, this death that is really untimely or this death that is very unseen, is one that we really struggle in terms of how do we acknowledge, how do we market, how do we show support for it, um, how do we wrestle with it, whether it's within ourselves, within our families, or with someone that we care about that we love. So that's an important context for us to begin with. Something else that I think is really important is that there most likely are people in this audience today that have been impacted by pregnancy loss, whether directly or indirectly. And so what I want to make sure that I do is invite everyone to be gentle with themselves, to be compassionate with themselves, to step away if you need to step away, to, you know, gather yourself, to, to pause if you need to pause, to do whatever it is you need to do um, should something be brought up for you. So I think that's just important that just like we want our clients to take care of themselves, that we know that that invitation applies to us as well, particularly when we are in trainings that we are choosing to do. So I want to start with what I think is a really useful and um, important couple of frameworks. And the first framework that I like to talk about is this idea of a reproductive story. And a reproductive story is something that all humanity has. So anyone who watched the preview video has seen me talk a little bit about this. Um, and it's not necessarily something that we give a lot of credence to or that we're even conscious of. And I want to give my colleague Janet Jaffe um, the acknowledgement because the framework of our reproductive story came from her and Martha Diamond. And how she conceptualizes it and how I think it's a really useful conceptualization for us is just as I said, all human beings have a reproductive story, whether we are aware of it or not. That story starts in our childhood. And that story might be something like, I don't want kids when I grow up. That story might also be like, I want to have 20 kids when I grow up. And we will see kids explore themes around nurturance, around caring for, um, around that executive functioning of being part of a family. We see that in their play. So this is not about gendered play. And I think that's really important to say, too, because I think um, we also tend to revert oftentimes to the idea that, oh, well, only those that are identified as girls, they grow up to be the nurturers, and those that identify as boys, they don't. But that's not true in terms of play. So if you think about playing with non-doll or non-kind of uh, human types of toys, whether it be stuffed animals or whether it be cars and trains, um, even when those toys are injured in some way, right, the trains crash together, Typically, the next part of the play is you look at, okay, what is the repair that gets tried to be made? So that's an example of nurturance. Or if there's a stuffed animal that has a boo-boo, you know, that's another example of nurturance. It doesn't have to be holding a little baby, although certainly that's an example of nurturance, one that we, you know, certainly connect and, and understand. So that reproductive story that starts in us when we are so young continues over time. And for many people, that reproductive story might change. So it might be that we go from this idea of I want 20 kids and we become a teenager. And we're like, oh, 20, that's a lot. You know, maybe I'm good with five. Um or you're a person who's like, I don't ever want kids. And then you meet somebody 
and you're like, you know, I never wanted kids, but maybe with that person I can imagine, maybe. And I've heard that story from people who identify as heterosexual. I've heard that story from people who identify as queer. So it's a very universal story. Um, and this idea of, oh, we can have kids together. Now, when we partner with someone, should we partner with someone? Because sometimes that idea of having a kid and not having a partner, that tends not to be the story a lot of people think about, but it's certainly a potential story that somebody could create for themselves. So when we find our partner, we have to acknowledge that our partner has their own reproductive story. So an example I like to give is that I came into my partnership with the idea that I only wanted two kids. I was one of two kids that seemed really manageable to me. That, you know, it just, okay, great, two kids. And my partner was one of three kids. So he came to our partnership being like, I want three kids because that's what he knew. That was what was typical for him. And so where we had to negotiate was, well, how many kids do we have? Now, of course, this is with the idea of like, sure, the only thing you need to do to have kids is just to want to have kids and it should be easy. And I think many of us recognize that stories don't always play out like that. So, you know, our, our compromise was let's have one and see where that goes. And I think, again, that tends to be, you know, another part of a lot of people's stories. What we tend not to plan for in our reproductive story, what I just alluded to, is that it doesn't always go as planned, right? There's that expression, which is humans plan and God laughs, right? Um, so the idea of, okay, this is what I want, but getting there might not be in the same way that I, that I imagined it. So again, we know that nursery rhyme, you know, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby and the baby carriage. But what happens if the journey isn't that smooth? What happens when there's lots of bumps along the way? And we're going to talk about some of those bumps in terms of pregnancy loss, which is absolutely not how anybody envisions their reproductive story going. So being able to think about what that reproductive story is and then living something that might be very different is one place where we as clinicians can intervene. And being able to help our clients have this idea of, all right, the story is unfolding, but you as the narrator get to decide how you feel about it and what you think about it and how you respond to it. You might not have choice about what the story is, but you certainly have choice in some parts of it. And so using this framework of the reproductive story, I personally find that it's a useful framework to bring up to my clients when I first meet someone new. Um, and in particular, because I am a reproductive psychologist and people are coming to me for reproductive issues, it's a question that makes a lot of sense. But if you're someone that works with kids, I think it's a question too that makes sense to ask the parents. You know, tell me a little bit about your reproductive story. Let me define what that is. Tell me how it unfolded for you. Because a lot of times when we don't ask parents of children that, even if we're just working with the children, we then lose an opportunity to understand this family in a more multidimensional kind of light because pregnancy loss can really leave its impact, even if they're living children. So it might be a useful framework to ask. And I tend to define what it is to my clients really briefly. I ask about it. Most of the time, the reaction I get is, wow, I never thought about that, huh? And then they'll very easily launch into, this is what I thought was going to happen. And then we talk about, and here's what is happening now. Here's what did not go, go to plan. The next lens that I think is really important as we come to this work, and also to 
to acknowledge and to appreciate PESI for scheduling this workshop when they did. So October is considered to be Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month, and the colors are a ribbon just like you're seeing here, this blue and pink. Um, and the idea is to symbolize all of the babies that are tend to be only remembered by their parents, sometimes others too. But again, to bring awareness, to bring a voice to what we tend not to talk about. For many people who experience pregnancy loss, they are also co-experiencing a traumatic event. Now, what's really important to frame this is that not all pregnancy loss is trauma or is experienced as trauma. There are a lot of pieces that can go into it in terms of how it might be experienced by an individual. So I certainly have worked with people where they might have had a six week miscarriage, a seven week miscarriage, and years later, that still really impacts them. And I've worked with other people when they've told me about that six week or seven week miscarriage, and it was really just a bump in the road for them. And it's not something that they think about more than just, oh, incidentally, this happened. So again, I think that's really important that we don't want to put words on someone's experience like, oh, you've had a pregnancy loss that must have been traumatic, but also to start thinking from that lens of trauma what got disrupted what about a person's identity might have gotten disrupted and one of the big places of disruption tends to be the idea about parental identity and we'll we'll talk a little more about that later but so thinking about it from that framework as well because again nobody plans to have a loss so it's not something that they're expecting. Oftentimes it comes out of the blue. It's completely from left field. A lot of times people don't even recognize this is something that can happen in pregnancy. We, we have this myth that once you get the preg positive pregnancy test, you're good to go. And nine months later, you'll have a baby. And the reality is that that is just not true for so many people. So bringing in this lens of trauma, because that's something we're going to want to look for. Trauma and grief are very different things. And while trauma can mask as grief sometimes, we want to look to see how do we parse it out so that we're not treating what we think is grief, but is actually underlying trauma. Um, that tends not to heal just with time, quote unquote. But again, we'll talk more about that. So let me let me ask you a couple of questions, some things to think about as we begin. In what ways has your own life been touched by death or grief and bereavement? And what did you find helpful during these difficult times associated with your losses? And what, if anything, can you translate in terms of patient care? And this is the time where I know we can't use the chat because there's just so many of us, but you know, this is where I would love to be able to hear from you all some of these thoughts, some of these answers. So I recognize we can't do that. If you have paper near you, I might invite you to just jot down some of your thoughts, type it on your computer, type a note on your phone. But to think about this, because we are so informed by our own experiences, sometimes positively in terms of our clients, sometimes in terms of the detriment of our clients. We think that because we've experienced grief or a particular grief, that this is the way to mourn. And yet, there are many ways. So also to think about if you or your partner have not experienced pregnancy loss yourself, imagine what it might be like to go through the experience of a miscarriage or a stillbirth. And if these are terms that you're not even familiar with, as we continue and we talk about it, I invite you to really think about, oh, what would that be like if that was me? What kinds of thoughts and feelings 
emotions might come up that might change you from this experience that might inform your experience how might you manage this loss and what would you need from your healthcare providers be that your therapist if you have one or your physician or midwife if you're working with one what is it you might need from them And I ask these questions because I think it's really important to center ourselves around the experience of loss. Because if we haven't experienced it, that's okay. We can still certainly work with people who have, um, but to really be able then to center, okay, what might this be like? How might I feel? Um, and I think, you know, for some people, the answers are, oh my God, I would be devastated. I would never be able to handle that. And I would really challenge you if that's your reaction. Because we encounter a lot of situations that, you know, objectively none of us would like to experience. And yet we get through them. So really kind of think about, all right, yeah, no, I wouldn't want that for myself. But what? What might I do to get through it? It might take me a long time. Can I be compassionate with that? What's the space that I'm in? So again, starting at the beginning, let's let's just talk about pregnancy. Because pregnancy is normative. It happens to many of us. Um, you know, we all would not be here if it wasn't for pregnancy because we all had been carried in someone else's pregnancy. And that is how humanity continues. So framing pregnancy is something that is very developmentally normal. I think what gets really complicated is that pregnancy is often looked at as a condition. <laughs> and I think that's really not helpful or useful because it takes it out of something that is normative. So, you know, it's something that people experience, but it's temporary. And there's a huge amount of change that occurs in that 10 months of pregnancy. Um, and that change isn't what necessarily everybody experiences, but there is pretty much a, a trajectory around it. So by framing it um, somewhat as a developmental task too, because I think one way of thinking about pregnancy is with the birth of a baby, whether that baby survives or not, comes the birth of a parent. So even that act of pregnancy is also part of that birthing of a parent. And so there is a developmental shift in what happens in terms of birthing a parent. Um, when we are alone or we're just part of a couple, we don't have to think about anyone except ourselves. Maybe if we're part of a couple, we're thinking about our partner too. So that becomes a shift when, when if we do decide to partner Okay, we go from just thinking about ourselves and our own needs to incorporating what our partner might need um, and figuring out how those needs meld together. When we have a baby, our own needs get pushed to the side because the baby is unable to take care of those needs by themselves. And so that in itself can be a developmental task. It's almost like the ultimate altruism where we have a baby and just to keep it alive means pushing all of our needs to the side. I can't tell you how many new parents I've worked with and they forget to eat and they forget to drink and they don't get the sleep that they might need um, all because it's in service of the baby. So I think when we're thinking about pregnancy, bringing back Eric Erickson and his model of psychosocial stages can be really useful. And when we think about parenting and pregnancy, it really falls in between two of his stages. So we start with intimacy versus isolation, the idea of partnering up. Um, 
being able to think beyond yourself, just like I was saying, but also that we don't necessarily need a partner, that part of that intimacy versus isolation of that resolution might be, well, I want to have a baby and I don't have a partner, but I can still do that on my own. So that intimacy might be that parent-child dyad versus that partner-partner dyad. And then, of course, the other stage, generativity versus stagnation, I think how people mostly tend to see it is you are successfully generative if you have children. I think that's really outdated. I think that um, there are plenty of ways to be generative without necessarily having children. And I think that we do people a disservice, whether they don't want to have children or they are unable to have children, to hold that stage as, oh, well, the only way to complete it is to have children. So I think that's just a really important piece, too, to think about, that there's a lot of ways that we can give of ourselves and propel ourselves um, in that sort of future remembered state that doesn't necessarily mean only having children. And yet, the idea of being a successful adult is to have children. So again, culturally, we're caught in this bind, and our, our clients are too. So part of what, what we need to work with is, how do we get them out of that kind of binary thinking that to be an adult means to have children? But it doesn't, and we know that it doesn't. And by the reactions I'm seeing on screen, you all know that it doesn't either. So that's great. Moving on in terms of pregnancy, it is really typical for people to kind of psychologically regress in pregnancy. It's a really physically and emotionally vulnerable stage. It's also this stage where development happens at light speed pace. So if we think about different phases of development, right? So we think about like, you know, childhood and even that early infancy, right? We're talking about infancy. You don't really become a toddler until you're about, you know, at least one, maybe two years old. And there is so much that is happening in that first two years of life developmentally for a kid. And all through early childhood, there's so much that keeps happening in terms of brain development, in terms of physical development, in terms of motor development. So we think about childhood and wow, that, I mean, that lasts years. It's a developmental stage and it lasts years. And then we think about the next developmental stage, adolescence. And that lasts at least a decade, mostly more because that tends to not end until our mid-20s. Some research is even showing late 20s, early 30s for some of us. Wow, think about that. You know, almost two decades in adolescence. That's a long time for all of that rapid change to happen, because there's a lot of change. There's a big difference between a 10-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a 26-year-old emotionally, cognitively, physiologically, lots of differences there. So thinking about that, like that stage, it unfolds and it happens bit by bit by bit. But when we're talking about pregnancy, 10 months, 10 months to go from two cells to an entire complex, separate human that can survive outside of a body. Wow. That's really incredible. And so when we think about pregnancy, we're talking about huge physiological changes in the person that is pregnant. We are talking about um, changes in their sleep patterns, changes in how their body looks and feels. Um, I remember my own pregnancy and the first time I was pregnant, you know, just taking a shower and being in that contained space. And, you know, I always know sort of where my body was in space. And as I got further and further along in my pregnancy, I remember going to bend down and pick up some soap and having my belly hit the wall. And I was like, what is that? 
because I couldn't keep track of where my body physically was in space anymore because my body kept on changing so relatively quickly. So just that interesting idea of like the physiology of how our bodies can change and how we interact in space for that. Um, it is the discomfort that some people experience in pregnancy. So we have a influx of hormones when a person becomes pregnant. And oftentimes that can cause a lot of nausea. It can cause vomiting. It can cause other, other difficulties in pregnancy. Um, we might feel our sciatic nerves really being pulled. We might feel what it's like to have organs pushed up because in order for our uterus to expand, it pushes up all of our other organs. Um, we might feel a sense of just pain or swelling. There's a lot of things that can happen, which again are normal but not necessarily normal to the person experiencing them for the first time. So that person can feel really vulnerable. And, and they'll notice that their moods can fluctuate. They don't have to, but they can. And that can feel really hard too. I think when we talk about the psychological regression of pregnancy, it's also thinking about that sense of being needy, the sense of needing help. And I think, unfortunately, we look at that as a regression or we look at that as something that adults shouldn't do. So crazy. Um, and that's not useful, right? Because we all need help sometimes and you are not conditioned or taught necessarily how to ask for it. So there tends to, it. it I think it's easier to talk about it as a regression um, since there tends to be shame around asking for help. But it's not, so it feels like a regression, but I don't want to say it is a regression. I think it's actually skill building, that as we learn to ask for help in pregnancy, it's a skill that we can take to postpartum. So that might be a useful reframe too for clients who are really struggling with, oh, I need so much help and I can't get around like I used to, and I just, I don't to be able to reframe it and to say, so you're getting a lot of practice doing something that tends to be hard for you because we're not taught to be comfortable asking for help. We're taught that that is not really okay to do. Um, so again, there's a lot of vulnerability. Uh, there's a vulnerability in that pregnancy is very seen. At a certain point, it can be a very seen thing for many people. I think one of the the helpful things for a lot of my clients that were going through a pregnancy after loss over the pandemic was to be able to be on a video where just, you know, their upper chest up is what's being seen. And so nobody could see this pregnancy that was developing. And so no one could comment on it. No one could remark on it. And and for a lot of my clients, that was really comforting that nobody could see it and they didn't have to answer to it and they didn't have to think about it. But I think there's actually something really developmentally important about it being seen. First of all, if there is going to be a loss and people are able to see the pregnancy, it means that there's a more communal experience that that pregnancy happened, that there are more people that can mark in time that that pregnancy was real, that it existed, that it happened. I think another thing that's really useful though about having that sense of being seen is there is a, um, a sense of community when people see someone that's pregnant. It's the only time in my life that somebody offered to um, give up their seat on the subway for me was when I was pregnant or when they opened doors for me when I was pregnant. So there's this sense of pregnancy being this really special time. And for a lot of people, it is. And, and that can also be one of the derivations of why a loss is so hard, is to lose out on that sense of specialness. And I don't mean that in a narcissistic kind of way. Um, I think for a lot of people, to be seen, they tend not to be seen or they haven't had that experience of being seen in their childhoods. So to be seen in this way as this 
bringer of life, as this nurturer, as this parent to be, starts to confer agency and identity on a person that even strangers can see. And so that too can be a really big self-esteem boost to people. There's a reason that we have children. Um, part of that reason is children are an appropriate narcissistic extension of ourselves. And I, I say that not because I'm using the word narcissism in a pathological sense. I'm actually really not. It's, it's a very healthy narcissism to want to have children because it's sort of this sense of, um, I can do better. I think in each generation, we, we think about how we can heal some of those wounds from the generation before heal some of the wounds that we might have gotten as a result of the generation before. So there's the sense of having kids enables me to help that next generation, that I can do better with them, that I can repair what I didn't get. You know, if I had ideas of what I would have liked as a child that I didn't get, I can try to do that to my future children. Or I can reenact the things that were really important and special to me, the places that I might have gone, the um, things that I might have done, the experiences I might have had, the traditions that might have been shared with me, that I'm able to recreate those um, and give that to the next generation. And so it's this idea of, I want to not replicate the negative of my past, and give an opportunity to reclaim what was positive because we we all have both in our past. We all have this. How many times as a child or as an adolescent even did your parents do something and you were like, if I have kids, I will never say that. I will never do that. So we all kind of have those moments. And I always know what's interesting for me is when, um, I kind of catch myself being like, oh my God, I I am my parent after all, huh? I caught myself sort of saying or doing, or those moments when I'm like, oh, I so know what my dad would have said right now, and I'm just not going to go that way. Um, so those kind of moments of, of how we define being different. Um, the other part of pregnancy where it comes back to that healthy narcissism is both liter literally and figuratively. Having a child gives us the sense of life everlasting. It gives us the sense of propelling a part of ourselves into the future. And that part might be genetic, but that part, which is also equally legitimate, might be only experiential or might be only emotional. So if I don't have a genetic connection to my child, as many parents don't, it doesn't mean that, oh, well, it's a bum experience. I don't get what I need from it. No, there's still that sense of, I can make sure that they are the good person that our world needs them to be. And I have a part of doing that. I can teach them these important values that I grew up with so that they can bring those into the future and that they can maybe make the world a better place. I'm being really idealistic here, but I think that's what having children is. It's idealism at its peak. So now that we have a context for what is normal in pregnancy, let's now start talking about pregnancy loss. And what I like about this slide is it shows 15 potential ways in which loss can be experienced. Some of these might be ways we've thought about, and other of these might be, oh, I wouldn't have thought about that, huh? So we're gonna talk about each of these losses. And what, what I would really love for our conversation to shift to, what I would love as one thing you take away from today, is to look at pregnancy loss as part of normative reproduction, because these losses occur with such regularity to so many people 
that if we don't look at it as normal and we kind of pathologize it or we other it, we don't then expand upon a conversation about it. We're unable then to talk about it because it's this othered experience versus looking at it as, yeah, this really sad thing happened and it really stinks that this happened to you. And it's one of many things that unfortunately can happen in pregnancy. The one we always hope happens is a live, healthy baby. And that's one of many outcomes of pregnancy. Because again, I think we really need to deconstruct the narrative that you get a positive pregnancy test and you have a baby 10 months later. It's not how it always works. But that if you have a loss, there's not something wrong with you, that this is an unfortunate part of what reproduction can look like. So that's how I want to normalize it. So let's, let's go into each of them, because I think that's an important thing to do. And the reason that I like to spend time going into each loss is because every loss has its nuances. And when I'm talking about nuances, I think it's really important that what I am not saying is there are some losses that are better or worse than others. Nope, not at all. A loss is a loss is a loss. And we can't create this like Olympic kind of thing for loss. And it's what I see tends to happen a lot in different pregnancy loss communities is there's, there's sort of this sense of like, oh, well, my loss isn't quite as tragic as her loss. So I don't really feel like I have space in here. I don't feel like my feelings are as valid because I don't have the tragedy quota that somebody else has. How does that help anybody? It doesn't. So I think really, again, it's basing it upon what is our client's experience of this loss, right? That's the important place. That's who gets centered in it. Not if we're like, oh, that was no big deal. No, that is no part of the conversation. Um, so let's start talking about failed IVF cycle. I bring this in, even though we're not talking about infertility today, because when people go through assisted reproductive technology, they are so aware of everything that, that is happening. Um, and that is really important and it's, it's useful. And... <laughs> It means that they are so aware of every single part of a potential pregnancy. So it means that when transfer day comes and an embryo is implanted into the uterus, oftentimes people are given a picture of that embryo. And sometimes it has sort of the, the text of it of like baby's first picture, which is lovely and sweet if it all works out. But if it doesn't work out, there's that sense of, ah. and I think what can be really hard about a failed IVF cycle is first of all, 35% um, of cycles fail. So this is a really common occurrence. 65% um, succeed, which is far better than trying to get pregnant the old fashioned way, much better statistics, but you're going through a whole lot more. Um, and because we have such awareness of what's happening and, and because it's so hard for some people to create embryos, that every embryo feels like, you know, it is a million dollars because there's so much time and effort and of course costs that went into it. So having an embryo that doesn't implant, because that's really what we're talking about. This is an embryo that for whatever reason doesn't implant. And so two weeks later, when you go to get an HCG test to test your blood for that hormone that detects pregnancy and that test comes back as negative, zero, there's that sense of failure that why can't my body do this? There's that sense of we've tried so hard and we weren't able to do this. Why isn't this working? This is a lot of effort. 
And what can be really difficult too about this kind of loss is that for many people, they're not necessarily sharing with family or friends what's happening. So they're sitting there and they're like, oh, nobody's knowing, I'm waiting to tell them because I'm waiting to have news to tell them. And that just gets more and more delayed. So there can be a profound sense of isolation if people have a failed IVF cycle. I think what can be also hard is the people who have been kind of documenting this and sharing a lot with families about all these steps. This can be really hard to say. And, and everyone knows and everyone's calling and do you have the results? Do you have the results? What happened? And so it can feel again, like we are acknowledging failure or defeat because this is again, how our brains are trained to think about it in this culture. And so that becomes really, really hard for people. So we have sort of these two different camps, the people who are open about their IVF journey, if they're, they choose to do so and the people who are not. There are merits to both, so I'm not trying to sit here and say one is better than the other. There are reasons that it makes a lot of sense to be hush about it. There are reasons that it makes a lot of sense to be open about it. Um, but to know that these are some of the nuances. I mean, I know that for some people I've worked with, I am the only therapist. I'm the only person, not just therapist, but I'm the only person who knows that they're going through IVF outside of their, their partner if they have one. So that's holding a lot of responsibility. And that means really holding space to process what this loss feels like. Another kind of loss, and I'm sort of ordering them in terms of when these losses might occur in, in the trajectory of a pregnancy, is a chemical pregnancy. And um, kind of a chemical pregnancy, <laughs> For lack of sort of a better way of looking at it, it's sort of like the April Fools of pregnancy. And it's a really cruel, cruel trick. So it's this idea of somebody might test and get a positive pregnancy sign on their test. And then they might bleed the next day. So if they're testing really early, um, right after when they would have gotten their last menstrual period. And that test might have come up positive because the tests are measuring HCG, which is um, a growth hormone that is what is used to propel pregnancy. And if you are not pregnant, you have a zero level of it. So it is not coming up in the test. However, if you are pregnant, it will come up. So, so there's... Um, I know some people in the pregnancy loss space, they, they talk about, you know, being a little pregnant. Um, I think sometimes too, when people are, they have that IVF transfer, they sort of talk about it as pregnant until proven otherwise. Um, and so it's like a little pregnant, but it's sort of, the, again, it's that experience of seeing yourself starting to go on that parenting journey. And so what can be really challenging about a chemical pregnancy is, first of all, oftentimes they're missed they uh, manifest more as a late period, especially if someone doesn't think that they might be pregnant, so they're not testing, they might just have a late period, and it's possible that that was a chemical pregnancy. But I think it can also be really difficult for the people who do get that positive pregnancy test, and it, and it feels like it's something that is just snatched away so quickly. And how I hear people talk about it when they're talking to me about their chemical pregnancies is, before I could even think too much about it or wrap my head around it or enjoy it or not enjoy it and be freaked out about it, it was taken away. And so it's really the sense of, I don't know how to feel about this because I never had the experience of feeling about this. Certainly that's not the experience of everyone. And I think that's important. There are some people who are trying to get pregnant. They see that positive test. They have a very definitive way of feeling about it. And should they start bleeding or should they take another test where those HCG levels are back to zero and it's not coming up as pregnant again? It does feel like something has gotten stolen from them. Something has been taken from them. Another kind of loss is something called an ectopic pregnancy. So an ectopic pregnancy occurs 
And you can see on this ultrasound um, picture where the ectopic pregnancy is. But the ectopic pregnancy occurs anywhere that is not the uterus. So pregnancy really needs to develop in the uterus. And the reason for that is the uterus is this amazing organ and muscle in the body. And it is the only one in the body that can expand. It can create help create the placenta. It can um, help create hormonally all the nutrients a pregnancy needs before the umbilical cord uh, actually starts to form. And so the uterus does this incredible job. It keeps this pregnancy safe, provides it what it needs. And it is the only, as I mentioned, the only place in the body that can expand in the amount that a pregnancy needs to expand. There is no other place in the body that is able to accommodate a pregnancy in this way. So it's not uncommon that as an egg goes down the fallopian tube and as sperm finds it and as they join together in the fallopian tube, which occurs during um, normal intercourse, sometimes what can happen is that newly developed embryo sticks to the fallopian tube instead of finding its way into the uterus where it then implants. And if it's sticking to the fallopian tube, it's not going to have that musculature that will enable it to expand so that the pregnancy can continue. The fallopian tube is not the only place where an ectopic pregnancy can occur. Sometimes the embryo finds its way into the uterus and then settles onto the cervix. Well, again, if it's attached to the cervix, if it's in the cervix, there's not that space for a pregnancy to grow and to expand. So because of this, what tends to happen in, in a ectopic pregnancy is that it's, it's because it's not in the place it needs to be to grow, it's, it's doomed from the start. It is not a pregnancy that can be viable. So oftentimes at a six week ultrasound, one of the things that people are checking for is where did the embryo implant? Is it in the uterus as it should be? And if it's not in the uterus, that's really important to know so that next steps can be taken. The risk of not treating an ectopic pregnancy is that inevitably it will rupture and it can cause sepsis and thus death for the person that's carrying. At this point in our medical advances, we are unable to take an ectopic pregnancy and move it into the uterus. Unfortunately, that is not something that can happen. Um, and so the only way then to mitigate an ectopic pregnancy is for the pregnancy to end. Um, oftentimes that is done surgically or it can also be, uh, actually with ectopic, it needs to be done surgically. It might mean that if an ectopic pregnancy is in the fallopian tube, depending upon when it's found, it might mean that the person might lose that fallopian tube. What's important then to know as clinicians is that they have just as equal as a chance of getting pregnant with one tube than they had when they had two. So I think a lot of times if people lose a fallopian tube, there's this fear that they're not going to be able to become pregnant, but many people are easily able to become pregnant. And it is very rare for an ectopic to happen in that other tube, although it can happen. So it's not automatically that if you only have one tube, you have to go through assisted reproductive technology. That's not true. People can get pregnant on their own. Um, but these, are, again, are some of the nuances, is potentially losing part of the body. What does that then feel like? People might feel less able in, in lots of ways. And so being able to support that kind of grief and maybe even challenge some assumptions too. The next kind of pregnancy I want to talk about is a molar pregnancy. And a molar pregnancy is also pretty rare. 
And what happens is sperm and egg come together, they might settle into the uterus. And instead of developing what is necessary to become a fetus, it's just more and more cells that start to cluster together and they're not taking the shape or they're not taking um, the, the structural integrity of what a fetus would mean. And so the concern about a molar pregnancy is that it's actually cancerous cells that might be forming um, and multiplying. And so when a molar pregnancy is detected, the way to treat it is with um, a drug that we use for cancer, which is methyltrexate. And quite often someone that has a molar pregnancy will need to be on methyltrexate for anywhere from six months to a year even after the pregnancy piece has, has been resolved. And the hard part about that is that there's this unacknowledged grief around, I can't even try again because I'm still on this medicine that's reminding me of this loss that I have. And for people who are older and who might be aware that their time to get pregnant is more limited, this can become a huge sense of loss, this huge sense of, oh, this is not, not what I have, and now I have to wait, and this might not happen for me. So these are nuances of a molar pregnancy, in addition to just what it feels like to have a loss that people might experience. The next kind of loss I wanted to talk about is miscarriage. And miscarriage, if we're thinking about it medically, and if you look in your medical records, it will say um, spontaneous abortion. And I think that is important in terms of how we think about it. We'll talk about that a little later because people tend to be really surprised that in their medical record, it says spontaneous abortion. But again, that's medical nomenclature. Miscarriage is defined as the spontaneous loss of pregnancy prior to 20 weeks gestation. So when a pregnancy is determined, and it's determined by that first day of your missed menstrual cycle where, where you've had a positive pregnancy test, you're already four weeks pregnant. So I think that's an important piece to recognize because not everyone recognizes this is how pregnancy is counted. So pregnancy is not actually nine months, it's 10 months because we count it from the first day of our last menstrual cycle. When we're thinking about miscarriage, the greatest factor that um, plays into miscarriage is age. And the reason for that is people that are born with uteruses and ovaries, um, have a certain amount of ovaries that they will have in their lifetime. There, there is some regeneration of ovaries, but not to the extent of what we're born with. Or actually, the, the time that a person that has ovaries has the most eggs is actually when they are um, a fetus inside of their mother, which is amazing to think about that already we have great drop uh, as soon as we're born, and even more of a drop once we get into puberty and adolescence. And then, of course, we lose an egg each month as we ovulate. So when people are young, when they are under 35, the risk of miscarriage is, is pretty small. I mean, we see in eight, between ages 30 to 34, that's 15%. Um, so that's a pretty small risk. We see that, you know, the younger people are, again, small risk. Now, what's also, I think, interesting is if you are too young, that risk is a little bit higher than um, as you get into your 20s. So 20s, I would say, is when that the lowest chance risk to have pregnancy. Now, of course, in our modern age, people aren't necessarily having their babies anymore in their 20s, where lots of us um, are waiting, not everyone. And so we're starting to see more and more miscarriages potentially based upon people starting having kids later. And what I hear from clients, I hear from them all the time is like, oh my God, I turned 35. I've now gone off the cliff in terms of, of pregnancy. And why they feel that way is 
they hear at 35, they're now considered to be advanced maternal age. And that's not really true. Like, okay, yes, there is a little increase. There's a 10% increase from that previous block um, to that 35 to 39 year old block. So now we're talking about, okay, one in four chance. Um, still three out of four chances that you're not gonna have a miscarriage. So as my, my partner likes to say, he'd go to Vegas with those odds. Um, where we really see risk of miscarriage really start to, to peak, and this is what I tend to, to say to my clients, is when people hit 40, because that's when the body is starting to prepare itself for perimenopause. Um, for some people, perimenopause doesn't occur until early 50s. For some, it's mid 40s, but you know we're starting to close that chapter on reproduction when we're getting into our 40s and 50s. That, of course, does not mean that people aren't having babies at this time. Um, they tend to, particularly in their 50s, tends not to be necessarily with their own genetics. That's okay. Um, and in their 40s, of course, that they can absolutely have healthy children in their 40s. But this is where we start to see a drop off in terms of the eggs that are left and those that are genetically uh, normal, those that are chromosomally normal. And when somebody becomes 45, that's really where we see that steep drop. So what we tend to be talking about too for miscarriage is that um, most miscarriages are the result of chromosomal abnormalities, about 50% of them. Um, and most miscarriages aren't necessarily even found, right? Or we're not testing to see, oh, was there a chromosomal abnormality or not? And so I thought that this was an important, a useful slide. When they say risk of aneuploidy, aneuploidy means that it's an embryo that has a chromosomal abnormality. And so this is the risk of chromosomal abnormalities um, looking at trisomy 21, which is also known as Down syndrome, as well as all the other chromosomal abnormalities and looking at it by age. And so what we can see is that when people become 45, there's a far greater risk of a chromosomal anomaly than when people are younger. Certainly the smallest risk is when you're in your 20s, um, you know, that, that risk starts to increase incrementally as we get older. And then certainly we're seeing 40, 45, that risk really increases. Um, so again, just an important framework to, to look at. Um, trisomy 21, a lot of pregnancies where trisomy 21 is pregnant or is present continue to term or they're able to continue to term. With many other chromosomal anomalies, what ends up happening is a spontaneous miscarriage. Not everyone, we will see um, trisomy 18 is one where there are a few people that have trisomy 18. Life expectancies tends to be pretty uh, narrow and um, trisomy 13 is another as well. But we tend not to see others. And, and as I said, we don't see many people who have those uh, trisomy anomalies because not many survive to term. And even if people are born with those anomalies, not many survive past the first year. Um, so we're not seeing it. Whereas people who have trisomy 21, they can live a pretty long life. So that is something that we see more. Um, so again, just things to consider. What can be really hard about miscarriage is again, people have that narrative of, but I got pregnant. And so it's supposed to go to the end. Like most people who have a miscarriage don't even realize that a miscarriage is something that can happen. They're not informed about it. And, you know, I, I sort of take two sides in this where I have clients who are like, why didn't my doctor warn me this could happen? And I'm like, yeah, it feels really hard to not have that information, to have not to feel like you got blindsided, to not be prepared. They're like, yeah, I'm like, what, what would it be like to have sat it with your doctor? 
who then spent the next hour telling you everything that could go wrong in pregnancy. My clients are like, oh, maybe I wouldn't like that. I'm like, yeah, that might not feel good either. So I think what's really hard is, again, because we don't talk about this from a normative perspective, people are left kind of on their own and not knowing. And that can be, again, really, really challenging. People also tend to blame themselves for miscarriage. They feel like it's a failure of them, which is why I emphasize that it's really important to know that the majority cause of miscarriage is something that's chromosomal, something that they could not have been prevented, not something that they directly caused, not something that they could have eaten better to have fixed or not have that beer to have fixed. Um, it was just something that was sort of preordained. I think, um, Another piece before I go on to recurrent pregnancy loss is to also talk about like that sense too of blame and guilt when it comes to miscarriage specifically. And I think because it can be really hard to test products of conception, I'm sorry to be so medical when I talk about that, um, because people will miscarry and they won't know and it's not necessarily happening in a controlled environment. Oftentimes though, we think about miscarriage and people notice that they're miscarrying because they knew they were pregnant and then they start bleeding. Um, and so they go to the doctor to have an ultrasound and to figure that out. And bleeding does not mean miscarriage, but it can be a symptom of it. Another nuance is for the people who are not bleeding and they go to the doctor for their heartbeats that I call, let me put that in quotes, heartbeat, because it's not actually a heart yet, but it is the electromagnetic pulses that will then eventually yield to the heart organ beginning. That um, when they go for that scan to get that acknowledgement of, yes, the pregnancy is continuing, it's it's where we want it to be, we can detect what, what that electromagnetic pulse is and how quickly it's going. So a lot of times people are really excited going into that scan and they get there and there's silence. And sometimes it's because there's a, a, a tech who's doing the scan and some states have provisions around what techs are able to say and what they're not able to say. So then there might be more waiting until a doctor comes in and verifies that, yeah, no, there is we're not seeing anything. This pregnancy doesn't seem to be continuing. Um, sometimes people are told, okay, let's wait another week and let's see, because, you know, growth is not linear. So growth certainly has a bell curve to it. So that tends to take people, they, it just comes out of the blue for them. And again, they had no idea. And so I'll have people who will sit there and they will analyze what did they do the last several weeks? What, what could they have done that caused this? What, what, um, what could they do differently another time? And so that becomes really hard too for them. And I, I reassure my clients, just like I hope their doctors are also saying, which is you did not cause this, you did not do this, your ambivalence perhaps around pregnancy did not do this. I think that's really hard too when I have clients who come in and they tell me they're pregnant and they're like, I don't know that I want to be pregnant right now. I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know if this is a good time. And so they come in with ambivalence. And then particularly for those clients who have losses, that can be so hard because they have this sense that my, my lack of connection to the pregnancy, my lack of welcoming it, my lack of being excited about it, that caused the loss. Very Freudian of them, but Freud's theory has been disproven. That is not how miscarriage occurs. So again, that's a really important piece that our clients in no way, shape, or form cause this loss for themselves. They just didn't. That's impossible. So again, things to consider, things to think about as a nuance for it. And most people who have a miscarriage go on to get pregnant and not have a second loss. Most people. So now as we are on the slide that I had already advanced to, there are some people that experience recurrent pregnancy losses. 
And so here tends to be how people feel. And this is pulled from research from people that have experienced recurrent pregnancy loss. So there's dread about, oh my God, getting pregnant again. And this is what's going to happen. There's fear, there's guilt, there's grief, there's anxiety, there's depression. There's this sense of what's wrong with me. There's this yearning to have a baby. There's so many pieces that can go. There's exhaustion. Why is this taking so long? Why can't I do what everyone else seems to be able to do so easily? So these are pieces to recur pregnancy loss that we tend to hear a lot in our offices. And it's really hard because the science behind recurrent pregnancy loss isn't where we have answers for all losses. So let's, I'm going to spend a little time talking about recurrent pregnancy loss because we, we really don't talk about it, right? Like these are the people where I think um, it, how my clients often describe recurrent pregnancy loss is they're like, yeah, I walk into the room and I'm that person that people are like, oh, she had all those losses. And like my clients would be like, I can like feel the pity emanating from other people when I walk into the room. And I think it's really hard to feel like whether that's true or not, but to feel like, oh, I'm the person with the big sob story. I'm the person that this is her for. And, and particularly because this is happening, you know, reproductive age is a finite time for people. That people in their 20s and 30s who want to build families tend to have other friends in their 20s and 30s who want to build families. And so if you are going through loss after loss while your friends are getting pregnant and having their kids, and maybe then getting pregnant with a second or a third kid, and you're still trying for your first, there's also that feeling of slipping away socially, that you're not only losing this dream that you have, but you're losing your peer group because they're now all raising kids and they're talking about diapers and diaper rash and, you know, blowout poops and all sorts of other things. And you're like, I would love to be able to participate in this kind of conversation. And I can't. So that's, again, it's another nuance of all of the factors of loss in addition to the actual loss. So some reasons for recurrent pregnancy loss can be genetic. It can be based upon the quality of sperm or the quality of the egg, um, or it could just sort of happen out of the blue. Oftentimes, if it's genetic, it might be a balanced translocation. So the only way that can be determined is with testing of the adult, because that adult will have that same balanced translocation as well. And that might be something to explore. Um, in terms of how we might manage this, because it's like, great, I'm carrying a balanced translocation. I'm not expressing it. It doesn't matter for me, but it seems to be one that we know can be concerning in terms of pregnancy loss. So we do have technology in which um, when we know what we're looking for, we can do uh, in vitro fertilization and we can do pre-implantation genetic testing where we're looking not just for aneuploidy, which would be chromosomally, but we're looking for, okay, what might that translocation be and which embryos um, that have been created might have that translocation, and those might be ones that we don't transfer yet. As I mentioned with miscarriage before, 50% of miscarriages are because of chromosomal anomalies. So most of recurrent pregnancy loss falls into this category, up to 70%. So that's a big piece that falls into it. Um, and the, the Anomalies might not just be trisomy. So when we're talking about trisomy, instead of having two copies of a chromosome, which is what we all have, we have um, 23 pairs of chromosomes, which is 46 total. So a trisomy is an extra chromosome on one of those lines. So instead of having 46, we would have 47. 
Um, but sometimes it's a monosomy, which means that instead of having 46 chromosomes, we have 45, one fewer than we have. One, one um, parent didn't contribute to that chromosome. Or it might be polyploidy, which means that there are maybe trisomy on some and maybe monosomy on others, or you're having multiple chromosomes that either have too many or too few. Um, when we're talking about an unbalanced translocation, where again, the, the chromosomes aren't balancing, as I mentioned before, most often that takes care of on its own in terms of a spontaneous miscarriage. Um, I think what becomes really challenging about that is what people will then say in terms of comfort, which is like, well, if you had a mi miscarriage, that's just nature's way of taking care of something. And it's like, oh, that is so not what people want to hear. Um, you know, again, there might be kernels of truth to it, but it's not what people need to hear or want to hear. However, it's also possible that people with unbalanced translocations can have a stillbirth or it can result into a live birth with a congenital defect. So lots of potential outcomes. When we see that an embryo is aneuploidy, so again, what that means is chromosomally anomalous, um, that again is the most common cause, and 90% of these embryos will miscarry on their own. So unless we are able to test that pregnancy, which, as I said, can be challenging to do, um, we might not have answers for this. There can also be uterine anomalies and uterine factors that can cause recurrent pregnancy loss. So as we see on the top left, we see this is what a normal uterus looks like. Um, and that uterus is sort of that top part. You can see the fallopian tubes coming into it. Um, you know, you can see the cervix and you can see the vagina in it. Well, there are lots of other ways, just like there are lots of other ways that people can look. There's lots of other ways for uteruses to look. And if you're seeing some of these drawings, like it can be difficult to see, okay, wait a second, in the... Um, Delphus uterus, like where would a pregnancy grow in that? There's not enough space. Even if an embryo implanted on one side, there's not enough space on that one side for that pregnancy to grow all the way to term. So that can be an issue. You can see an, ar um, an arcuate uterus where that little gap is at the top. And again, that's condensing what the size is of the uterus. The uterus needs all the space that it can get. I mean, it needs so much space that it's pushing up other organs to accommodate. Um, so we see all these different kinds of uteruses where we're not getting the space that's needed. And it can, it can cause recurrent pregnancy loss. I've been listening to a podcast that I think is really interesting and it talks about recurrent pregnancy loss and it talks about um, uterine factors, which again, we tend not to really hear. And then that podcast is called Unexpecting, and it's about the um, figure skater Tara Lipinski and her very long journey of infertility. So I have nothing connected with it, but if you wanted to learn a little more about it, it it's her sharing what her experience has been. And I think that can be really useful. So when we have uterine anomalies, we can acquire them. So it's something that we might not have been born with, but they they come over time. Um, that could be through adhesions, that could be through polyps, that could be through myomas. Um, they can be congenital, which means this is how we were born. We might have structural anomalies. Um, again, showing the different kinds of structural anomalies. We see that 19% of people that have recurrent pregnancy loss it's a uterine factor and it might be a uterine anomaly or it might be something that develops like, um, you know, there is a, a septum in the uterus, which shouldn't be, and you might be able to remove that septum, but if there's still retained septum that's there, that can cause recurrent pregnancy loss. 
And many of these abnormalities, these congenital anomalies can be treated with surgery. So once they are discovered, there tends to be um, surgeries that, that can assist with it. Not all the time, and certainly you would want to confer with a surgeon that is skilled in this area. Um, there's some other factors. We talk about weight, and I, I have a really hard time talking about weight because I feel like it's so blaming and shaming for people. And that again, it doesn't come from this perspective that weight is not an indicator of health. It is an indicator of shape um, and shape is shape, right? So I think it can be really hard. And I think our evidence isn't clear enough necessarily to sit there and to say weight in and of itself, overweight is, it, oh, I'll put that in quotes, in and of itself is a factor in terms of recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, certainly we know that being underweight can cause issues because most people who are too underweight aren't even able to sustain a period. So that means that they may or may not know when they're ovulating and they might not have enough weight in their body to sustain a pregnancy. So that to me makes sense um, physio physiologically. The overweight piece, I do look at the research of it. I'm just not convinced. Um, I think there's too much that we put on BMI. I think there's too many health indicators that we attach weight to, that weight has nothing to it. And I just see too many people who get blamed and shamed because of um, their appearance. I mean, I have a client who was talking about needing to have their um, knee checked, like they twisted their knee and they went to urgent care to have their knee looked at to make sure it wasn't broken or <clears throat> dislocated or anything. And they got a handout about BMI. I mean, come on. Um, so that's not useful or helpful. So that's a piece. Um, I have a whole lot more to say on that, but that's not what today is about. Age. So age can be a factor, just like what we were talking about before, where as we get older, we tend to have fewer um, people, again, that were born with ovaries tend to have fewer eggs. And of those eggs that are remaining, they tend to have those that are chromosomally abnormal. So this is where those kinds of issues might come in in terms of recurrent pregnancy loss. And we do know that lifestyle factors, we know that smoking, that's not useful. Alcohol intake, that's not useful. Um, that that too can cause recurrent pregnancy loss. I wanna add to it that it's not just cigarette smoking. But I would include, because many states have it as medically okay or as um, also legal, that cannabis smoking has detrimental impact to conception and pregnancy. And we don't think about it because I think oftentimes what we tell ourselves is, but it's a plant, it's natural. How can it be harmful? Well, I would also say, you know what, arsenic is natural too, but I'm not going to go out and consume a lot of that. So getting away from the idea of natural is good, it, it maybe, but you know, also water, that's natural, but you can have too much water. So thinking about that as well. Um, so another more medical reasons, we, we blame pregnancy loss so much, unfortunately, on the person who might um, have ovaries, who might have a uterus that might be presenting as a woman or not. I think we need to talk more about sperm. We need to talk about possible factors of what else can contribute to pregnancy loss because women, and, and I use that term inclusively, um, and or people that have uteruses that can withstand, withstand pregnancies, are so blamed, whether they're doing it internally or whether, oh, was it that workout you did? Or, oh yeah, you had that shot of tequila before you knew you were pregnant. Yeah, you know what, that's fine. It's all fine. Um, so let's think about what, what male contributions can be. 
um, you can think about karyotyping, right? Like men come to you and they put in their sperm, their genetics, which means that there is a whole DNA pattern to it. And there's chromosomes that are with there, which means that there can be genetic anomalies. They're not typically chromosomal. We do have a sense that when we're looking at chromosomal anomalies, those those tend to be egg factor anomalies versus sperm factor anomalies, but there are other genetic anomalies that sperm can carry into a pregnancy. So DNA fragmentation, that can impact how an embryo forms. Um, if we are having a sperm that comes into an embryo and it isn't bringing all of the information it needs to bring, that's gonna be problematic. It means the embryo doesn't have the blueprints that it needs. Um, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine doesn't recommend routine sperm DNA fragmentation testing for recurrent pregnancy loss, but I think it might be useful for some people to look at it, particularly if you're working with a client and they're talking about all the testing that they've gone through. It can be useful to say, oh, has anyone talked to you about testing that your partner might go through? Now, I recognize we, we are not reproductive endocrinologists, we are not physicians, we are not OBGYNs, maternal fetal medicine specialists, um, but it might be useful again just to say it's worth asking the question because what we can do is help our clients advocate. We also know that, you know, because sperm carries uh, X or Y chromosomes that particularly Y chromosome microdeletions which we can find a lot in people who don't produce as much sperm, something that's called uh, isospermia, um, that can be a factor for recurrent pregnancy loss. And we really need to learn more about sperm. We don't talk about sperm. We figure, oh, sperm is fine. You know, again, let's, let's blame it on the woman. Um, so all things to think about. And I think, I think I can get in maybe one, maybe I can finish this, this thing before we go to the break. Um, a place that we don't talk a whole lot about, and I think one of the challenges in terms of talking about it is that we don't have enough consistent research for guidelines to be created. And that tends to be how medicine advances, is that we do some research, we have a question, we repeat the research. If it shows the same thing, oh, we're getting closer to answering that question. We might repeat it again and again. And if we're seeing the same thing, that then can influence how we practice. That can influence the guidelines that we might recommend. When we're talking about the immune system, that is something that's really a burgeoning area. I would say the immune system as well as like the gut biome is another emerging area too. So, you know, we know that infections like sexually transmitted infections, like cryomegala um, virus, like rubella, that those can cause loss. We know that um, autoimmune factors like lupid and antiphospholipid syndrome, and maybe even some thyroid disorders can cause pregnancy loss. We know that things like celiac disease and Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, those are autoimmune responses, right? That's they might be disorders, but also their responses are telling us that something is inflamed in the body and here's where the body is going to try to heal itself. We know that blood disorders like thrombophilia, which causes blood clots and factor V Leiden, um, which can also lead to clotting issues. These are areas that we're exploring around recurrent pregnancy loss. And there's the idea too that some people, well, we all have natural killer cells, but that some people, their natural killer cells look at fetal tissue as an invader. And so they do what they do, which is like, oh, this isn't supposed to be there. Let's get rid of it. And that again is another um, possibility for recurrent pregnancy loss. But I think when all of this is looked at, again, where, where it's getting hard is the research isn't, isn't being replicated as consistently as people need for it to cause guidance in the entire field. 
That being said, there are board certified immunologists that are looking just at this that also work with reproductive endocrinology. And they're looking at, well, how might this play? And, you know, I, I have the anecdotal experience of clients who weren't getting pregnant until autoimmune issues were detected and were treated and then pregnancy occurred. And I recognize anecdote is not evidence, but also it's not nothing. Um, so what's, what's hard is that there's not a lot of statistical differences when we're looking at losses that included thrombophilia, factor five, NFS, lipid syndrome. Um, and they were compared between groups that had two recurrent losses and groups that had experienced three, that they weren't able to factor out, oh, this was it, this is why people had more losses than not. So I think that the research continues to emerge, and I think it will be really exciting as we know more. Um, we also know that there are endocrine factors. So things can be mixed about polycystic ovarian syndrome being a cause of hypothyroidism and diabetes. Again, here's more places where we, we need some more research for it. And then my last slide before we take a break is there's unexplained or idiopathic reasons for recurrent pregnancy loss. And I think this is where it's the hardest to be because all people want is an answer because once you have an answer, you can make you, you can take action, you can figure out the fix, you can have a path forward. And not having that path forward is really hard. So looking at genetic, anatomic, endocrine, immune evaluations, when those come back as normal, that can be really hard. Um, there's not a whole lot of evidence that recurrent pregnancy loss is inherited unless there are certain conditions that are met, like um, interleukin genes, which can impact implantation. And then what's really hard, just like I'm saying, is that people might have recurrent pregnancy loss and depending upon where you are in the world, recurrent pregnancy loss is either defined as two losses or it's defined as three losses. Um, there's not a consensus about what we do about it. So some physicians might add progesterone to a pregnancy. Some might do immune treatments. Some might suggest for PGTA testing. So pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, looking at the chromosomes. But we don't have a consensus in terms of how we go forward. So on that note, let's take a 15 minute break. Um, I will see everyone back here. That would be 1047 Eastern time. 947 Central Time, 847 Mountain Time, 747 for all of you awesome people on Pacific Time that might be tuning in live. All right, I will see you all soon.